You'll turn with me to first chapter first Samuel chapter nine. We'll commence reading at verse one and we read through to the end of chapter ten. Saul is chosen to be king. There was a man of the Benjamin of, of them. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeor, son of Bekorah, son of Aphia, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders up, he was taller than any of the people. Now, the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul, his son, Take one of the young men with you and arise. Go and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim, and he passed through the land of Shalashah, but they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Shalem, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. When they came to the land of Zuk, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to, be, to, cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. But he said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honour. All that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, But if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? And the servant answered Saul, and he said, Here, I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer, for today's prophet was formerly called a seer. And Saul said to his servant, Well said, Come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. As they went up the hill to the city, they met, a, met young women coming down to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? And they answered, He is. Behold, he is just ahead of you. Hurry, he has come just now to the city because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. As soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes, since he must bless the sacrifices afterwards. Those who are invited will eat. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. So they went up to the city, and they were entering the city, and they saw Samuel coming out towards them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people because they cry, their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He is who shall restrain my people. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, where is the house of the seer? And Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go and will tell you what is on your mind. As for your donkeys, 
that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Saul answered, Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? Then Samuel took Saul and his young man and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited, who were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion I gave you, of which I said to you, put it aside. So the cook took up the leg and what was on it and set them before Saul. And Samuel said, See what has kept is set before you. Eat, because it was kept for you until the hour appointed that you might eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. And when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was made for Saul on the roof and he lay down to sleep. Then at the break of dawn next day, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, up, that I may send you on your way. So Saul arose and both he and Samuel went out into the street. And as they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, tell your servant to go ahead before us. And when he had gone ahead, he stopped and yourself. And when he had passed on, stop here yourself for a while that I may, for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and he poured it on his head and he kissed him and he said, has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord and you shall save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. When you depart from me today, you will meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at, Z at Zelzar. And they will say to you, the donkeys that you went to seek are found. And now your father has ceased to care about the donkeys and he is anxious about you, saying, What shall I do about my son? Then you shall go on from there further, and coming to the oak of Tabor, three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall accept from their hand. After that, you shall come to Gibeah Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines. And there, as soon as you come to the city, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a harp, tambourine, flute, and a lyre before them prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Then go down before me to Gilgal and behold, I am coming to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. When he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all these signs came to pass that day. When they came to Gibeah, behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and, the, and he prophesied among them. And when all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, what has come over the son of Kish? 
is Saul also among the prophets? And a man of the place answered, And who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? When he had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. And Saul's uncle said to him and to his servant, Where did you go? And he said, To seek the donkeys. And when he saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Please tell me what Samuel said to you. And Saul said to his uncle, He told us plainly that the donkeys had been found, but about the matter of the kingdom of which Samuel had spoken, he did not tell him anything. Now, Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah. And he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God who saves you from all your enemies and your distresses. And you have said to him, set a king over us. Now therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its clans and the clan of Matarites was taken by Lot. And Saul the son of Kish was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. So they acquired again of the Lord. Is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. Then they run and they took him from there. And, they, and when he stood among the people... He was taller than any of the people from his shoulders up. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, Long live the king. Then Samuel told the people the rights and the duties of the kingship. And he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his home. Saul also went to his home at Gibeah, and with him went men of valour whose hearts God had touched. But some of the worthless fellows said, How can this man be how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. Thank you, Roger. <clears throat> we'll be only uh, reading to uh, um, preaching up to ch- uh, verse 16 of uh, chapter 10. But let's uh, just uh, pray and uh, before I, I preach. Oh Lord, we, we thank you for uh, your word. And even though uh, there are some puzzling things about it, Lord, I pray that uh, you'll give us insight into uh, those things you want us to hear this morning. Speak uh, through your word uh, to us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder how many of you have uh, read your Bible and you have wondered or you have asked the question, what is going on here? Why is this passage in the Bible? You know, chapter 8 ends with Samuel telling the people to go back to their own city and to, for God was going to give them what they demanded. He was going to give them a, a king. And now we are wondering who this king will be and, and how he will come to be their king. And, uh, and then here... Um, In chapter 9, the chapter begins uh, by a a young man looking for lost donkeys. 
You know, he passes through the land of Ephraim looking for them. He, he cannot find them. He, he goes through the, the land of uh, Shalisha, uh, but he still cannot find them. He carries on through the land of Shalom, he, and, and they're not there. And then he goes to the land of Benjamin, and they're still not there. And he comes to the land of Zuf, and you guessed it, still no donkeys. And you ask yourself the question, what is this all about? Uh, what is going on here? Why is this in the Bible? Uh, what is this to do with finding a king? How can something like this, searching for lost donkeys, have any significance? And so when Sam asked me to preach from this passage, I just thought, oh, I wonder what I'm going to say here. Now, this passage all seems so ordinary, and yet it is in the ordinariness of life that God works his eternal purposes out. So let's look at this passage and see how God works out his purposes through these mundane things. And the chapter begins with a man from the tribe of Benjamin, and his name is Kish. Uh, twice in this verse we are told he's a Benjaminite. Uh, why is that significant? Because the Benjaminite tribe was nearly wiped out in the book of Judges, if you remember, in Judges 19, when uh, men from the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin brutally raped and killed a Levite concubine, and then they refused to repent. And so Israel rose up against uh, their own tribe and nearly wiped them out. The tribe was hated by Israel. They had acted disgracefully. And here is a man from this tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, being talked about. Surely he is not going to be king. This man called Kish is wealthy. He has a son called Saul, who is a handsome young man. Look how he's described in verse 3. Uh, there was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. He was a hulk. He's like me. Um, <laughs> a very handsome young man. Uh, uh, from his shoulders upward, he was taller than any other person. So he was, pretty, he was a basketballer. Uh, the word saw means uh, to ask for. Uh, the children of Israel ask for a king, and here is a young man named Saul uh, who seems to have the credentials. Furthermore, the idea of a handsome one can also be translated chosen one. Uh, here is a man Israel would choose. He's handsome. He's literally better than all those around, uh, and they have chosen him. He's taller. He's better looking. He, he's obviously an impressive young man. It's interesting, though, that later on the Lord said to Samuel, he, he said uh, in 1 Samuel 16, 7, he said, uh, there was this sort of fashion parade going before uh, Samuel and he's um, uh, working out which one of these men was going to be uh, the future king. And the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or the height of his stature because he says, I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, first appearances are not always the best picture of a person, as we will later find out. However, we're left wondering, is this the, the man whom God would anoint as king of Israel? And there we go to a series of events in Saul's life. Uh, Saul and the lost donkeys, verses 3 to 10. Saul and Samuel, verses 10 to 27. And Saul's confirmation in uh, chapter 10, 1 to 16. So firstly, Saul and the lost donkeys, verses 3 to 10. The story of the impressive uh, son of Kish begins on a remarkably 
ordinary note. Look at verse 3. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. You couldn't get any more ordinary than that. Note, trouble had been simmering in Israel. The people are demanding a king, but here we are taken out from the city uh, into the countryside to a rural family and to some lost donkeys. In chapter 8, we have uh, sort of this people demanding a a king. In chapter 9, we have the story of lost donkeys. The situation couldn't be any different. From the stress Samuel is under in chapter 8 to looking for a few donkeys. So Kish asks Saul to go and look for them and to take uh, his servant with him. He he passes through the land of Ephraim, uh, uh, the the land of Shalisha, Shalem, the land of Benjamin, and they get to Zuth, no donkeys. It's also interesting to note that that Saul uh, seems to be an obedient son. Uh, Unlike uh, the sons of Eli or the sons of Samuel. Samuel's sons were also disobedient. Saul obeys his father and he goes. He seems to look everywhere for them. He searches far and wide. He spends three days looking for them. And eventually he wants to give up. Uh, Look what it says in verse 5. When they came to the land of Zuth, Saul said to his servant who was with him, come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious for me about us. He's concerned that his dad might be worried for them and they had looked for the donkeys long enough. It's interesting too that that Zophar is the land where Samuel's great-great-grandfather was born. This land was uh, named after him and it was also the region where Samuel lived. You know, at this point, uh, Saul's uh, servant takes the initiative. Look at verse 6. But he said to him, this is the servant, says to uh, Saul, Behold, there is a man of God in the city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. Perhaps we can find these donkeys. He can tell us where these donkeys are. It does seem strange, don't you think, that, that Saul was unaware of Samuel. He doesn't even appear to ever have heard of this man of God, this, uh, this Samuel. Perhaps the news of Samuel hadn't uh, reached Saul's part of the world, I don't know. Maybe there's a lack of, lack of awareness as to how out of touch people were in those days to the things of God. Saul is hesitant to go. Look at verse 7. Then Saul said to his servant, But if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is God, and there is no present to bring the man of God. What do we have? And this, in a way, endears us even more to uh, Saul, doesn't it? Saul doesn't seem greedy. He, he, He thinks that if he's to see Samuel, he needs to take something with him. That was the tradition in those days. Well, maybe, just maybe it reflects a a lack of commitment on Saul's part. He doesn't want to see this man of God. He he seemed very quick to turn back, but the servant is quite determined to see this man. Look at verse 8. The servant answered Saul again, Here I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. So Saul agrees, verse 10. And so they go to see this prophet, the seer. Now, while we might be getting a favorable impression of Saul, that he is an obedient son, that, he, the, that he's actually concerned too for his father, and that he seems to be a generous man, that he wants to give something to uh, the prophet, to the man of God. On the other hand, we see that he's not necessarily a leader. In fact, he's being led by his servant. He's giving, he's giving the instructions. He's telling Saul where to go. 
But I want you to know, can you see how God is using the ordinary things of life, the looking for the lost donkeys, to achieve his purposes? And sometimes, you know, I think that that uh, in our lives that uh, we may be doing mundane things. It may be the gardening. It may be uh, just going off to work as we do every, every day. But God can use these things in our lives to achieve his purposes. So we have uh, Saul looking for donkeys. Secondly, we have Saul and Samuel, verses 11 to 27. Saul and his servant head uh, for the city where the prophet or or man of God lived. It was probably, or it could have been uh, the city of Ramah, although we're not told. As they approach the city, there's this sort of familiar scene. They, They meet some woman who had been drawing water from the well. And so they ask these women where they can find the seer. I say familiar because in in the Bible, you will recall that on a number of occasions, uh, uh, people encountered women at the well. The story of Isaac, the story of Jacob, the story of, of Moses. Each includes scenes like this that uh, were defining moments in their lives. Here is a defining moment. Jesus also met the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, and Jesus offers her living water that will spring up to eternal life. Here, in this passage, the timing is remarkable. Look what the young woman say, uh, say in verse 12. It says, they answered, he is, behold, just ahead of you. They asked, where's the sea? And he said, he's just ahead of you. Hurry. He has just just now. He has come just now to the city because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. As soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat till he comes, since he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. Suddenly, the world of lost donkeys was the fir- for the first time coming into the, uh, the world we left in chapter 8. Saul is approaching the city at the same time as Samuel is going into the city. And note, those women know what Samuel will be doing. He will be offering sacrifices uh, to the people. Uh, So Saul and his servant go into the city and they find it exactly as the woman said. Uh, They see Samuel coming toward them on his way to make the sacrifice in the high place. It's interesting that that the Lord warned Samuel the day before uh, that this would happen. Look at verses 15 and 16. Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, tomorrow about this time I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people uh, because their cry has come to me. In other words, it's out of these very ordinary events that God is working his purposes out. The lost donkeys were a means by which Saul comes to meet Samuel. Samuel was to anoint Saul as king, to be the prince over the the people of Israel. Saul was to save uh, God's people from the Philistines. And why was God doing this? Because he had seen his people and he had heard their cry. He had seen his people and he had heard their cry. You know, I find this amazing. The Lord is compassionate. The Lord is gracious. He is kind to his people even when they go astray. Thank God we are saved, not by our own righteousness, but by the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Samuel sees Saul coming toward him, verse 17, and when Samuel saw uh, saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man whom I spoke to you. He it is who will restrain my people. Here the Lord identifies Saul as that promised man. It was he who would restrain the people. It was he that uh, would uh, uh, hold the people back from becoming like other nations. And you know, Saul is completely unaware of this. He doesn't even know who Samuel is, verse 18. It says, Then Saul approached uh, uh, Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, where is the house of the seer? But imagine the surprise or shock at Samuel's response in, 19, in verses 19 and 20. Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. He says, go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I'll let you know, uh, we'll let you go, and we'll tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? So while Saul does not know who Samuel is, Samuel is only too aware of who Saul is and what is on his mind and the plans that God has for him. He says, I am the seer. But then there's this sort of invitation to, to Saul to come up to the high place where he would eat with uh, Samuel. And again, it's a reminder of the time uh, when Isaac and his servant were looking for a wife and they meet a woman at the well and they uh, take Isaac back to, with his servant back to their house and they have a meal for, uh, waiting for them. Here Saul meets a woman at the well who direct them to the seer who invites them back for a meal. In fact, what we see in 2 Samuel uh, verse, uh, chapter 5 is that the king was to be the husband of the people. The king was to be the husband of the people. Jesus is our king and he is the bridegroom of the church, isn't he? And you know, this story has echoes of this sort of thing about it. The best portions of meat were prepared and cooked for Saul. There were the guests. Saul is being treated like a king. He's being treated like a, a, in a place of honor, like the bridegroom who's waiting to take on his duty. Here is the bridegroom, Saul, at this meal. Note two, Saul said, uh, uh, Samuel said the, the donkeys had been found, but then Samuel says this curious thing that I'm sure that Saul doesn't have a clue about. He says, and for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Of course, we know that what had only recently been desirable to Israel, or rather what Israel had demanded from, the, uh, from God, they wanted a king, chapter 8. And we can be pretty certain that Saul had not heard about that. And look at Saul's reply, verse 21. Saul answered, he says, Am I not a Benjaminite uh, uh, from the least of the tribes of Israel? And uh, is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? You know, Saul doesn't have an idea, has no idea what Samuel is on about. He's this humble country boy who has no claims to greatness. Why, he's a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel. And he's from the smallest clan of the Benjamite tribe. So the reluctant Saul is escorted to the hall. Look at verses 22 to 24. Then Samuel took Saul and his young man and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of, the, head of those who had been invited, who were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, bring the, uh, the portion I gave you, of which I said to you, put it aside. 
So the cook took up the leg uh, 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 and what was on it, and he set it before Saul. And Samuel said, see what, I ha- what was kept is set before you. Eat, because it was kept for you until the hour appointed, that you might eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. It is like a wedding feast. Saul is in this place of honour. You know, one doesn't know what God has in store for us. From looking for donkeys, to meeting some girls at a well, to meeting a prophet, of having a meal at the place and in a place of honour, who would have thought that? God working through the mundane things of life, showing that he is sovereign over all our affairs. I guarantee that when Saul went to sleep that night on the roof of Samuel's house, his mind would have been working over time. What on earth is happening to me? I start out looking for donkeys, and now they're talking about me being a king. You know, we need to see that God is working his purposes out through all things. We need to be ready for whatever God brings our way. Who knows the plans that God has for us and and what might be in store for us. From humble beginnings, the Lord might have some great things for us. From Saul looking for donkeys... Saul and Samuel, and now we go to Saul's confirmation. Chapter 10, 1 to 16. The next morning, Samuel tells the servant to uh, go on his own back to uh, Kish, uh, back to uh, his home. Uh, Samuel obviously wants to talk with Saul alone. Then that morning, Samuel anoints Saul as king. Look at verse 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you shall save them from the hand of the surrounding enemies. And you shall be, and this shall be a sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. Imagine that. Starting off looking for lost donkeys, you end up being anointed as king. Saul will fulfill the desire of Israel for a king. Does Saul believe it? I'm not sure. Saul knows he's from the tribe of Benjamin, the most unlikely place to find a king. And also, uh, when Saul goes home in verse 13, his uncle asks him what Samuel had been talking to him about, and Saul says, uh, uh, doesn't say anything about becoming a king. But here in this passage, Paul, uh, Samuel gives Saul three signs to prove uh, that God will be with him. Firstly, in verse 2, two men will meet him at Rachel's tomb to say the donkeys had been found. You know, it's interesting that it's Rachel's tomb. Remember, Rachel was the favorite wife of Jacob, and Benjamin was her favorite son. In fact, in Genesis 45, God also promised that kings would come from the tribe of Benjamin. The second sign was that three men would meet him at Bethel and offer him bread, and, uh, and, uh, or two loaves of bread, in verses 3 and 4. And the third sign is that uh, Saul will meet at Gibeah with a group of prophets, and he will prophesy in verses 5 and 6. Now, for those who are unaware, Gibeah is the place where the Benjaminites are, uh, uh, raped and killed Levi's, Levite's uh, concubine in Judges 19. And Israel, as I said, was so enraged that they were nearly wiped out the tribe of Benjamin. Perhaps, just perhaps, this is a, a, a sign of their, uh, Benjamin, the Benjaminite's restoration. Verse 9 says, When he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all these signs came to pass that day. These signs confirmed his anointing. 
Saul was given this new heart, a change had come over him, and these signs were fulfilled. Interesting, though, only one of the signs was really spoken about. It was the sign of Saul prophesying. And uh, uh, Look at verse 10. And when they came to Gibeah, behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied among them. And when all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, What has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And a man of the place answered, he said, And who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? When he had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. Something happened to the son of Kish. Who is his father now? Who is his father now? And the answer is that he is among the prophets. And the implication being is that Samuel now is uh, like Saul's adopted father. Just as Eli's sons were replaced by Samuel, now Samuel's sons are replaced by Saul. Just as Eli adopted Samuel as his quasi-son, so Samuel adopts Saul as his quasi-son. You know, later on in 2 Samuel 7, we read that God said to David's son that he would be a father to him and he will be his son. But as we look at this story, it also points to one who would be the true son of God, to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, at his baptism, we hear the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. On the Mount of Transfiguration, just before he was to be crucified, we, we hear that same voice, this is my beloved son in whom we, I am well pleased. You see, this is the true ruler. This is the true king who came to this earth, who began his ministries with the words, the, the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus doesn't hide that message as to who he was, unlike Saul who would not tell his uncle, but proclaimed the kingdom of God to all who came to him. It points to the true prophet, to the true priest, to the true king who came not to offer uh, sacrifices of bulls and lambs and goats as the, as the prophets of old did, but offered himself on the cross for us. Who died once and for all that we might have eternal life and who comes to us today as one who sees and who one who hears and, who, and one who meets us at our point of need. He is the one who works through the ordinary things of life, even through the search for donkeys to bring his purposes about. Let us as his people see that the Lord works through even the mundane things of our lives. Let us see that we're part of God's much bigger plans let us take up every opportunity to serve him, no matter how inadequate we may seem. Let us see that God can use us in no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in to achieve his purposes so that he might be glorified. I pray that in the ordinary things of life, we might see God work in and through us as we go about our daily lives. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for uh, your amazing love to people such as ourselves who sometimes let you down, who sometimes fail you and sometimes 
do things that you do not want. I thank you that you see us and you hear our cry. And we thank you for the way you worked in this situation through the search for donkeys to bring about your purposes. Lord, I pray that for each of us here that as we live out our daily lives, I pray that you would help us to see how you work through the mundane things of our lives to bring about your eternal purposes. Help us to realize that you are a God who is sovereign over all things through the good, through the difficult, through the ugly things of life and that you can work in and through these things for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.